welcome to another episode of Speaking of Saints on Rahai. Today we'll be celebrating the life of a poet and a mystic who played a leading role in the 16th century reform of the Carmelites. So come join me as together we discover what made St. John of the Cross the prison poet. Juan de Epizi Alvarez was born on the 24th of June 1542 at Fonteveros Old Castle. His father Gonzalo de Epizi belonged to a wealthy family of silk merchants. However, he married Catalina, an orphan of a lower class, because of which his family rejected him and he was forced to work with his wife as a weaver. John's father died when John was only three years old. Two years later, his older brother Louis also passed away, probably as a result of malnourishment since the family was reduced to abject poverty after the death of the father. Following the death of her husband and son, Catalina was forced to take John and his surviving brother Francisco to different places until she finally found work in Medina. John entered a school for poor children, mostly orphans, where he was given basic education, mainly on Christian doctrine. The children there received food, clothing and lodging. John had the kind of childhood that could have scarred anyone. It could have made him bitter or angry. But we see that John's experiences only led him closer to Christ and closer to the cross. Which begs us to ask ourselves, have our wounds made us bitter or loving? More compassionate or more selfish? Which brings me to the first point that I would like to talk about. We must allow Jesus to heal the wounds of our past. To heal the wounds that the loss of loved ones has caused. To heal the wounds that life has inflicted upon us. So that we can be more compassionate and loving, more generous and giving. For as St. John himself said, In the twilight of life, God will not judge us on our earthly possessions and human success, but rather on how much we have loved. Growing up, John worked at a hospital and studied humanities at a Jesuit school from 1559 to 1563. The Society of Jesus was at this time a new organization, having been founded only a few years earlier by St. Ignatius of Loyola. In 1564, he traveled to Salamanca University, where he prepared for his priesthood and in 1567, he was ordained a priest. His journey from Salamanca to Medina del Campo proved to be a pivotal one because it was here that he met the influential Carmelite nun, St. Teresa of Avila. This was to be the beginning of a beautiful friendship. Teresa shared with John her vision for the order. She was seeking to restore the purity of the Carmelite order by reverting to the observance of the primitive rule of 1209. Under the rule, much of the day and night were to be spent in the liturgy of the hours, in study and devotional reading, in the celebration of Mass and long periods of solitude. John was attracted to this kind of spirituality not just because it was more rigid or stricter, but because it gave more room for solitude and prayer. And John realized the importance of this. Which brings me to the second point that I would like to talk about. We do need moments of solitude and silence. There is too much chaos around us, sometimes more inside than outside. We need time for stillness, for silence. Staying by Teresa's side, John discovered a new form of Carmelite life. And in October 1568, he founded a monastery for friars the first to follow Teresa's principles. On 28 November 1568, the monastery was established and on that same day, John changed his name to John of the Cross. At some time between 1574 and 1577, while John was praying in a loft, he had a vision of the crucified Christ, which led him to create his drawing of Christ from above. In 1641, this drawing was placed in a small monstrance and kept in Avila. This same drawing inspired 
the artist Salvador Dali's Christ of St. John of the Cross. The years 1575 to 77 were very difficult as they saw a rise in tensions among the Spanish Carmelite friars over the reforms of Teresa and John. The discalced Carmelites found support in the then papal nuncio to Spain, Niccolo Ormento, and he protected John for a while. But after his death, the friars who were against the reforms took over. On the fateful night of 2nd December 1577, a group of Carmelite friars who were opposed to the reforms broke into John's dwelling and took him prisoner. John was brought before a court of friars and he was accused of disobeying the ordinances. Despite his argument that he had not broken the ordinances, he was sentenced to a term of imprisonment. He was jailed in a monastery where he was kept under a brutal regime which included weekly public lashings before the entire community, severe isolation in a tiny stifling cell measuring barely 10 by 6 feet. Barring the few occasions when he was provided an oil lamp, he had to stand on the bench to read his breviary by the light through the hole in the adjoining room. He had no change of clothing and a penitential diet of water, bread and a few scraps of salt fish. There were times when he would overhear the friars saying that his food had been poisoned. Believing this to be true, John would forgo his meal. You see, they didn't just try to break him physically, but mentally as well. However, they couldn't touch him spiritually. Because John's strength was not physical or even mental, it was spiritual. Which brings me to the third point that I would like to talk about. Do we care to nourish ourselves spiritually? For it is written, man does not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. We must spend time reading and reflecting on the word of God if we long for spiritual nourishment. For when the storms of life hit us, when sickness cripples us, and when our mind plays tricks on us, it is not growth strength or even willpower that will support us, but only the word of God. The words that I have spoken to you are spirit and life. During his imprisonment, John composed a great part of his most famous poem, Spiritual Canticle, and a few shorter poems as well. The paper was passed to him by a friar who was guarding his cell. Eight months later, on 15th August 1578, John escaped prison. He did this at night through a small window in a room adjoining his cell. He had managed to prise open the hinges of the cell door earlier during the day. Later, St. John would write, On that glad night, in secret, for no one saw me, nor did I look at anything, with no other light or guide than the one that burned in my heart. After being nursed back to health, first by Teresa's nuns at Toledo, and then six weeks in the hospital at Santa Cruz, John continued the reforms. 1580 was a significant year in the resolution of disputes among the Carmelites. On 22nd June, Pope Gregory XIII signed a decree which authorized the separation of the old and the newly reformed discalced Carmelites. John of the Cross is considered one of the foremost poets in Spanish. Although his complete works add up to fewer than 2,500 verses, two of them, the Spiritual Canticle and the Dark Knight of the Soul, are widely considered masterpieces of Spanish poetry, both for their formal style and their rich symbolism and imagery. Interestingly, this was also the Golden Age of Spain, a time remembered for its artists, poets, playwrights, novelists and explorers. At a time such as this, it was easy for a frail friar who was out to reform yet another religious order to be overlooked. But today, history remembers St. John of the Cross as one of the most influential guides of all time. My dear friends, there is a lot in the life of St. John of the Cross that we couldn't cover today. Please feel free to write in the comment section below favorite incident from the life of St. John of the Cross or perhaps a few verses from his poetry. 
At this point, dear viewers, we would like to thank you for your prayers and support. If you like these videos, please share them with your friends. This is a beautiful way to evangelize. If you'd like us to pray for you, please feel free to write to us in the number given below. And now, may we pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for the gift of St. John of the Cross. We thank you that his teachings have inspired and helped so many souls down the ages. Dear Father, today our world seems to be going through a night of the soul. We pray that you will guide us through this dark night. We pray especially for all those who are in hospitals, for those who are grieving the loss of loved ones. We pray, Lord, that you will heal us and have mercy on us. We make this prayer through the precious name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Saviour. Amen. Thank you. God bless you and see you next time.